but you know, speaking of NFTs, we've got a uh, fun lineup on um, NFT, an NFT art panel. So we've got Lindsay Howard, a curator exploring uh, network art and cultures, Matt Condon of Softspot Art, Sarah Zucker, a crypto art curator, um, and Blake Catherine, a Los Angeles based 3D artist. Super interesting people. Um, you can all turn your cameras on and yeah, let the host take it away. <laughs> so, um, I'll let Sarah, do you want to start <laughs> introducing yourself? Sure, why not? Um, <laughs> hear me, hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, hi, it's nice to see my fellow panelists, like, you know, in the virtual flesh. Right. Um, my name is Sarah Zucker. I'm a, an artist and a writer based in Los Angeles. I've been a digital artist for probably about 10 years. I was a photographer before that. Um, I moved into video around 2011 and that has started me on this long strange trip into GIF art, uh, which has now given way to crypto art uh, in the past year and a half. Uh, it's always very funny to me when I get referenced as like a crypto art OG, since this is something I've only been doing for a year and a half, but that sort of uh, you know reflects the newness of the space that we're in. Um, I create what I what I like to call digital analog hybrid art, uh, which means I, I like to sort of um, intermix cutting edge and obsolete technologies. Uh, I like to say that my work sort of exists in its own dimension. You know, I like to create things that uh, by using this this retro or obsolete technology sort of takes us out of this very shiny futuristic moment we're in and creates this sense of the now, you know, within the, the infinity loop, that sort of nexus that we're in, um, looking backwards and looking forwards. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'm the Sarah Show on all social media. If you want to find me, I'm eminently findable. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, I, I see that Lindsay, the host of this uh, panel, has just come on. So Lindsay, over to you. Hi, everyone. How are you? Good. Hey, doing Good. Well. I'm Lindsay. I'm the head of community at Foundation. We are a crypto powered marketplace where we support artists who are releasing NFTs out into the world and trying to market. Did you hear that? Are we good? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was a little funky, but. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and Sarah just introduced herself and her background. Okay, cool. Yeah, I just got a little bit of a glitch there. Um, all good. So we just released um, a new NFT product for digital artists to come in and monetize their work. Um, I've always been really interested in supporting digital art, digital artists, and And finding um, collectors to support their work. And that's what we're doing at Foundation. So we've supported work by Blake and Sarah and about 25 other artists. And so I wanted to bring you all together and Matt to get to know you as well um, to talk about this space and what we're experiencing here. So Blake, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, sure. So thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Blake, Blake Catherine. Uh, I'm based in Los Angeles, been here about five years now by way of New York. Um, and I've been about a, th a 3D artist for about five years as well, uh, since 2015. I came from a traditional graphic design background. Uh, I studied at the University of Florida, thought I wanted to go into branding and advertising, kind of uh, did, my, did my dues in New York and realized that I felt a connection more towards the artistry of it, especially coming from Florida where we have Art Basel and all this like really beautiful, vibrant, um, 
almost kitschy at times art communities. And then going to New York and seeing those more refined galleries really sparked me into being like, what is my voice? What is my creative impact? You know, I don't want to be a logo person or an icon person. And it led me down this really fun techie rabbit hole of learning 3D and totally positioning myself from a design background to more of one from an artistic perspective. And so that further uh, just kind of diving into things that inspire me to this day. Uh, my subconscious, uh, just ethereal kind of uh, dreamy moments. I'm quite in the clouds most of the time. And uh, really exploring like what is in my surroundings. Uh, I take a lot in from my immediate uh, environment, such as pastel um, and art deco moments from Los Angeles, uh, refined minimalism from my New York time, and then whatever I can kind of pick apart and just plug into my work itself. And so now I'm a full-time 3D artist, which I feel blessed to be able to say. And uh, I'm quite new to the crypto community. A year and a half that Sarah said sounds amazing. You're like a wizard. I'm, <laughs> I'm like three months in, I think. And so it's been really amazing to learn. Uh, you know, I obviously still have bills to pay. And so I'm a commercial uh, 3D artist as well. And I still do have to, you know, put in those moments where I'm like, all right, let's figure out how to get a product in here. Let's figure out how to make, you know, this brief come to life in my style and to see how crypto is enabling people to actually just pursue kind of their passions and their actual voice uh, from an artistic perspective is just really mind boggling to me. And I'm excited to be here and to keep learning. Thanks, Blake. Yeah. Matt, would love to hear from you a little bit more about your background and what you're working on at SoftSpot. For sure. Um, yeah, my background is in um, a lot of technology stuff, worked at a bunch of startups and got into crypto in 2017, much like probably most of uh, the crypto scene today. That was that was the year. Um, but yeah, quickly like found myself um, really just, my, my mind was blown over the ability to own a digital thing that was the biggest like like crazy shift for me um and and i just spent like months being like what do i do what do i do about this i'm like i see it i see the future it's like i can own a digital thing that's incredible what do i do about it um but yeah ended up doing a bunch of different experiments um and and like um experimenting with a bunch of different weird mechanics and i, I love that you mentioned like bridging the physical and digital um, stuff, Sarah, because one of the first experiments that I was trying is I have a chip in my hand, um, an NFC chip, and I made it such that there was a scarce digital piece of art that you could only get if you scanned my hand. So that was the in like this digital scarcity realm. Um, and yeah, just like playing around with a bunch of different stuff, ended up, um, uh, let me think, I have, yeah, it ended up like working on like creative economy stuff, um, realized that um, the the monetization model of, you know, how we monetize art and how artists support themselves um, is generally like pretty broken on the internet. Um, it's a very, there's a very long tail and a very winner take all sort of situation in terms of like the top one, 2%. Um, <clears throat> and flattening that curve was a big motivator um, for me and in the sense of like the thousand true fans theory and so on and turning you know the the average person into a collector and sort of making it so that more artists can support themselves doing what they love um, in a way that doesn't need to be like incredibly viral successful but can just be sustainable um, and so uh, my co-founder and i who we saw uh, an hour ago uh, experimented with um, like using nfts as a way to create a monetization mechanism for Twitch creators, where um, you would buy these rare digital stickers as a viewer and then drop them on stream as a reaction sort of thing, much like emoji reacts or emotes rather. Um, and so we experimented with that. People loved it, but it didn't really, um, like we, we tried to do a lot all at once. Um, but yeah, we, we've been experimenting with that and then ended up working on SoftSpot, which is all about like, how can we make the experience of digital art um, just really good and meaningful online. Um, how do we take our worldly, our, our holistic experience of art in the real world, which we all know and love, it's, there's sort of like a lot of context there and meaning uh, for these objects. How do we bring that to digital art where by default, like maybe, um, you know, it's just a, it's an image or it's a record on the blockchain and like that. There's, there's not enough 
there's not like a, a meaning or context there to make me really care about it. Um, and so bringing that in, in specifically the context of art, SawSpot is designed to create an environment of a digital place where um, digital art and digital digitally owned things can be meaningful. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up this point about virality. I've always mm -hmm. felt like there, that was a real tension point for me that I've tried to understand. That's one point for painting, in my opinion, is that you only need to find one collector to like one object out in the world. Mm -hmm. But with digital stuff, it was like, do you need to find something that is going to be so popular and so common that right. you know, people are going to want to purchase it? But then with yeah. unique Geez, you that kind of turns it it's on its head, right? Like you don't need 100%. to make something that's going to appeal to absolutely everyone in a kind of Warholian way. It can be that one weird fucked up thing that only has one collector who understands and appreciates Fine. it. Yeah, be as weird um, as possible. But there's, but there's something beautiful about it. Right, yeah. And that's like the web and, and advertising as the business model, I think is what created a lot of that for online creators. Um, and, and advertising is that sort of like you need the scale for it to work um and and that, that middle ground is really tough to navigate so you're sort of like investing in your, in your uh your brand and your creative process without like you know you can't hit minimum wage with two thousand viewers looking at ads you need like two hundred thousand exactly um, and so it's a really tough gap to to bridge for artists and i i you know i tried and failed and yeah it's it's tough so yeah, flattening that Sarah, out and making that middle process, absolutely. Sarah and Blake, how is this? Um, how does this impact your work? Are you thinking about a piece that, that needs to be received by tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people? Or are you thinking about really just expressing what you need to say in a given moment when you're creating new work? You know, it's it's funny you you brought up Warhol because I I think he is a really good. Uh, predecessor use case for us in the NFT art world to kind of look at. Um, whenever I'm trying to explain to people what we are doing here and how it functions, and they if they can't wrap their head around, and, and a lot of it, times it's other artists, you know, you'll get into these philosophical debates with other digital artists who are so used to the way we've been doing things, you know, typically client work, um, it, not understanding like how exactly a digital asset works. And um, it's it's just to say that I, I often refer to Warhol to help make sense of it for people, right? Because Warhol's whole thing was pre-social media virality. You know, he was taking images like the Campbell Soup Can or Marilyn Monroe. And the whole point of it was, you know, the, dis the mass dissemination of that image. And the more Warhol's work is visible, the more t-shirts and bags and you know ad campaigns and whatever you see his images in the more that translates to the value of those original screen prints you know mm -hmm. um, i think we can view an nft as like i said i i started with a photography background and i worked for a time in the photographic uh, art market and i i really see how that translates here because digital art similar to photography uh there's no original you know, there's no mm -hmm. painting that it is, the original is just an image that is infinitely reproducible, just like with photography. Yes, there's an original negative, but that's not the art. The art is the image that comes off of that negative. So it's just to say that I, I find a great way to contextualize it for people is, you know, if, if I or if Blake have, have a piece that goes viral, so to speak, a piece that gets a ton of visibility, um, the person who collects the NFT of that piece should celebrate that. We all can celebrate Absolutely. that because that adds yeah. to the cultural value of, of this digital object, this asset, which is a single edition Absolutely. or perhaps a limited edition NFT. Um, so I've just found that, that this has allowed me now to take my social media, which you know I've developed a social media practice over the years. And now instead of it being this sort of like, okay, I guess I'll, try something, try to get these numbers that mean nothing, these millions of views that do not equal dollars in my pocket, um, that, that really the, the previous model was you make good work and you wait for emails. 
You know, you make something cool, you put it out there, you hope it goes viral because then maybe a brand will contact you and go, hey, we saw your cool thing. Will you make something for us for for an, an appropriate amount of money? And now we have this model where we are creating a cultural ecosystem, a cultural market of our of our own around our own work and what we want to create, what is most fundamental to ourselves and our self-expression. And we don't have to find a way to sneak a tennis shoe into it or sneak a water <laughs> into it. You know what I mean? Now it's like myself who sometimes I, I I think my work might fit well into the category of like lowbrow art. Like I love to be as weird as possible. I love to make things that are like, you know, on every brand brief you get, it's like no drugs, no sex, no, no yep. disparaging <laughs> the government, no, you know, and I want to do all of those things. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so this now allows me to translate those views into just like Warhol did with his imagery and continue mm -hmm. posthumously to do with his imagery mm -hmm. to translate that into, uh, you know, uh, actual like translatable currency values around if I choose to release editions of that piece. So now my social media, it's now flipped that like, it's a testing ground for me to see, okay, what do people really respond to? What are the pieces that mm. natively really take on their own, um, you know, organic growth because people are just jumping on it and it helps me uh, established for myself. Okay, that one I'm gonna I'm gonna price a certain way. Then there are others I make. This is always the case with any creator pieces you create that like no one sees, no one likes, and you're like, oh, you're my special creation. Statement <laughs> <laughs> for me about crypto art is now I have a place for those too, and I have found like personally I do a, a style I call video paintings that I create with like this video painter that I always wanted as a kid and my parents would never get for me because it was like a ridiculous thing to get a child. And now <laughs> I have one as an adult. And I make these ridiculous illustrations and drawings with them and they get terrible engagement on social media. Like the algorithm sees it and is like, what is that crap? I'm not showing this to anyone. And they always have, and they continue to just wow. not really get shown. Mm -hmm. um, even though they, I can tell people like them, I get, you know, I get love on them, but they just don't travel. Right. And now those have gone on to be my most valuable pieces in the crypto art mm -hmm. world. I think because mm -hmm. they are so anathema to mm -hmm. algorithm art, they are so yeah. anathema mm -hmm. to what we're used to seeing, um, you know, propagated to us on, mm -hmm. on Instagram. And it's not to knock those things, you know, I, I think a lot of that work is fantastic. But I am a creator whose work right. sometimes can can fit into what the algorithm wants and very often does not. That's so, so interesting. It's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Blake, yeah. you also have like a huge following. I'm wondering, like, does that play <laughs> into your mind when you're making a piece? Are you thinking about how it's going to be received? Are you thinking about the algorithm? I have such a love-hate relationship with every social platform because I really don't believe if you if you really value yourself as an artist, right? Not a content creator, because there is a difference and some people do associate more with one person or the other. Oh, fun about it. Um, <laughs> intermission. And we're good. Um, but yeah, so like with that, um, you know, it can kind of what Sarah said, it can be really disheartening at times, because sometimes it really is difficult to unplug your value from these algorithms that now we are trained to just be used to, you know, it's like the bully that's at the corner just being like, where's your lunch money? Maybe I'll give you likes, maybe I'll throw you in a trash can. But like, for me, when I create artwork, how I view it for the crypto world, at least, is I really see it as the patron fine artist relationship, you know, uh, like people talk about the whales and there are kind of like a scarcity with certain collectors valuing pieces at a certain price point. But it's amazing to see how digital artworks, regardless of how the algorithm tells you if it's good or bad, can actually uh, garner like really amazing respect in this community and sell for a price that enables you to then push yourself on a quality level and not worry about, I need to post every day or I need to post every three days or Instagram will yell at me or make me feel like a loser for a bit. And it's like, no, it's not like that. You can actually spend more time doing research and development and honing in and crafting your own skills and really sharpening your artistic portfolio and maybe even ushering in, you know, movements with this new tech that you haven't previously thought possible. And it's all because you're actually like, 
being seen and respected on a way that, you know, I can feed myself with the crypto community. I can't feed myself with Instagram giving me 10% engagement one day. And so I, I don't view it so much as a symbiotic relationship, even though naturally, you know, if all of us, I assume, if we're engaged in this community have to market to some degree, like we're not immune to marketing in that way. But I view it as a way where you're no longer tied to what social media tells you is going to work or is popular, which, you know, as a commercial artist still, I do have to take that into account if I want to, you know, get Smirnoff to hire me or something like that, because that pays my bills for three months. And it's like, that's important. So it's really awesome to be able to just see how much it opens up the space for artists to be able to like really look inward and to explore that because there is a payoff at the end. I'm guessing we have some people who are tuning into this who are totally unfamiliar with the NFT space um, or maybe artists who are curious coming in for the first time. If I was watching this without that context, I would want to know what is it about the crypto space that makes it so unique? that you as artists can pay your bills through crypto, but can't pay through Instagram? What is it about the community or what is it about the structure that enable this like genuine support for artists um, that these other systems lack? If you had to guess what were <laughs> or like genuine theories about this, I still don't know exactly what it is, but what do you think it is that, the, that exists in the crypto space that doesn't exist elsewhere? Right. Well, I mean, it's in the name, you know, it's the hybrid of cryptocurrency and art. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if I were to, again, I think the Warhol paradigm is a great way to explain this to people who are just like, I don't, I don't get it at all that NFTs, non-fungible tokens are this new technology we have that allows us to create these additions, these, these digital assets similar to a Bitcoin, say, mm -hmm. you know, if you are familiar with what that is, it is a digital currency. This is now a digital asset. A painting is a physical asset. An NFT is a digital asset that you can hold in a digital wallet, just as you could hold a painting in a physical collection. Um, and so what we're seeing and what, I mean, truly we see it change. I'm seeing it change every day. Like I said, I've been in this space for a year and a half and in 2019, the amounts we were seeing were like <laughs> one tenth, one hundredth of what we see now. Um, so it's this thing we often see in, in cryptocurrency. It's a parabola, right? A parabola of interest, a parabola of amount spent. Um, and that comes from, I, I, from what I perceive being an artist first and a cryptocurrency person second. Mm -hmm. That is a cryptocurrency thing. That is, you know, a lot of this money being spent is coming from people who are primarily uh, cryptocurrency enthusiasts, people who are investors, you know, they're interested in DeFi, they're in, uh, decentralized finance, you know, um, for a lot of them, and this is really no different than the real art world, they see these as investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I always catch myself before I get a bit too utopian about all of it, that there's plenty about this that is just mirroring the real art world, you know, that this is mm -hmm. people finding a place to park their money into an asset that they have evaluated that they think will increase in value. Okay. But to speak to what, you know, what Blake said, I have also found to be true that there absolutely is this um, culture of patronage that's emerging. Mm -hmm. That, you know, I saw some meme the other day that said something of like, don't worry, after the plague came the Renaissance. And part of part of crypto art rising this year, I think is is inextricably linked to COVID. It is the fact that this year we had this sudden, everyone had to go underground, everyone had to go inside, everyone had to go online. So suddenly these things that those of us were already doing online that everyone was kind of going, yeah, I don't know, they're doing that weird thing over there. Now this year, everyone is running to us internet people going, oh dear God, how do we do this? How do we, go online? How do we still like make things have value now that we're all online? And we're all like, right. okay, come, come, come. This is how, this is how we do that. And so I think, you know, al allow me to be a little utopian for a minute. <laughs> what we are seeing is that that same thing is happening weirdly, mm -hmm. you know, after the plague comes the Renaissance comes these, mm -hmm. these people who come in who do have the funding, but who also have an interest in the arts and an interest in artists mm -hmm. and are going, are establishing relationships, um, you know, with artists to 
to allow them to no longer have to do brand work, to allow them, or at least to, to de dedicate less of their artistic practice to commercial work. I have found that to be true this year. I have done, I have done really only the commercial work that I felt excited about. And that mm -hmm. to be in that position after years of doing this Amazing. is, I, I can't even state what a, what a, what a paradigm shift that is for me and Absolutely. what a paradigm shift that has been for my art practice. Yeah. Absolutely. And a lot of times when I chat with artists too, like, um, because you know, you're selling something, it's precious to you, or if it's not, uh, maybe look inside yourself a bit more and figure out to make it precious. But, uh, but like, they're like, okay, someone buys it and they're like, what, what does it do? Do they just look at their phone? Like, and it's a lot of times having to almost do as Sarah said, go into a utopian, like, fast forward to the future moment where it's like, you know, there are spaces that are arriving. Like I've spoken with some collectors, it's almost everyone who's collected any of my pieces I've created. I've had very uh, in intimate conversations with, like we'll talk before they purchase it and we build that relationship. And uh, I was introduced to Somnian space, which is like where you can, you know, import your work. Maybe you can see an animation or something go into a three-dimensional space, et cetera. And you can interact with it in that digital um field you know you can actually like have a moment where it's like this feels tangible like this is really cool and that's when you're like okay I get this idea now because it's if you're a fine artist you're like maybe you have a main collector and it's like that main collector might throw an exhibit with your work and it's like there are moments that we are working on the technology to get to where your work might be appreciated in a really amazing way that you just can't technologically totally wrap your brain around yet so it is a bit of that early adopter moment you know from the techie side but then when the artists hear that then they're like well okay where do i sign up like i'm super stoked like i thought they were just buying a gif and it was just going to be looping on a background for forever and it's like no there's so many ways that it can continue to evolve and and with the passing of time and the advancement of technology, it's just going to get more and more innovative and exciting for how these artworks do translate for these collectors or these communities and collectives, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I totally echo that, especially on the sort of like future forward um, perspective. Like a lot of like my personal collection is like, I just wanted a piece of history. Um, mm -hmm. like I just wanted that piece of history and there's some things that are you know i'm never going to get rid of because to me they they represent like that future um and there's is absolutely a crypto nouveau rich especially a lot of like if you had bitcoin in the day it goes up you have a shit ton of ethereum now what are you going to do with it diversify art's really cool um i think what's really interesting about crypto um like in the distinction between crypto collectors and um like a traditional collector um, I think what's interesting about the crypto people um, is that they're digitally native or in a sense that they, mm -hmm. they really do get the digital scarcity thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a, it's a large bridge to, to jump for people. Um, you know, like you've experienced like having to communicate like what this means to a, a traditional artist is like, yeah, it's, it's a really hard, um, not hard, but it is a, a fundamental shift in understanding. Um, and I think people who, are, who have been into crypto just already get that. They already get that the bits aren't scarce and that doesn't matter. They already get that, you know, the blockchain is true ownership because of the 20,000 nodes around the world all verifying that you know, it's still in the correct state. Um, that it, they, it feels like they understand the concept of digital ownership already, and that's so much easier. Um, mm -hmm. To, to explain so for me it's like yeah i do feel like i own this digital like a crypto punk or something i feel like i own it but at the same time exactly like the the whole loop isn't there yet like there's mm -hmm. not a really great place for me to experience that um maybe if you see me at a party and we're a few beers in i'll pull up my phone and be like look at this isn't this amazing? <laughs> but that's not like a really natural thing to do um and so yeah absolutely it's like based on this future forward um, perspective and like, yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to this question of what does it mean? Like, what do you actually own when you purchase an NFT? Um, five years ago, selling digital art in gallery spaces, I was working with artists who were making custom designed USB drives and mailing them out as like bespoke objects to collectors and the digital art on the stick was the actual piece. But you had to do something physically to communicate that there was something of value here. So I'm curious how you all answer that question when people say like, what do you actually own when you buy mm -hmm. an 
or when someone purchases one of your NFTs. And I think this can be a con I'm looking for concrete responses, what they own, but I'm also looking for um, if there is something more like kind of spiritual or around this as well, like what are you actually purchasing? What are you actually buying into? Well, as, as someone who tried to sell a custom USB back in the day <laughs> as a, as a media real. artist and, and like <laughs> you can only fancy, fancy up a USB so much, you know, it's not like the most exciting uh, prospect. Um, why this is exciting and, I, you know, I've heard media artists be a, a little bit a Twitter about, about the possibility for this since Ethereum hit the scene, you know, because... What you own is this this token, you know, this token mm -hmm. of, of ownership. It'd be again, it'd be if 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 a photographer put out a limited edition of a hundred prints, you own print number thirty five. Do you mm -hmm. own the image? No, you do not. You know, uh, most I can't speak to Foundation Lindsay. You probably could better than I could. I know at least on Super Rare, it's in their terms of service. It makes it very clear ownership of the token is not a transfer of intellectual property. It is right. not a transfer mm -hmm. of copyright. Yeah. Um, so I, I like to make sure people understand that because, you know, sometimes things arise. I've seen it on Twitter. It, it hasn't happened to me personally, but things arise where like collectors will, you know, want to make t-shirts out of a token they collected or something mm -hmm. like that. And it's like, mm -hmm. actually, you don't have the right to do that. You can't photocopy a Warhol and sell the photocopies. You know, you own the print, but you don't own reproduction rights. However, I have also heard discussions of this this asset class of the NFT, the non fungible token, that could be defined differently in the future. This we could see this become a way that how artists do sell IP rights, how artists mm -hmm. do sell copyright. Uh, especially in the music industry, I think that's going to be huge of how in the future, this could be how musicians sell the rights to the use of their music in something. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. represent anything. Not to get too yeah. off topic about it, but the ownership is, I think, Lindsay, it's it's interesting. You, I don't know if you use the word spiritual or like that it is that on a, on a certain level. We can go there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you own this token, right? And so from a purely utilitarian perspective, you own this token that exists on the blockchain, just like someone could own some Bitcoin or could own some Ethereum. Um, and that token has a determined value, just like in the real art market, we determine values or the IRL art market, we, we determine values based on previous sale. And, mm -hmm. you know, if something sells at Christie's for a million dollars, we go, OK, that is a painting that is worth a million dollars. And if in five years it sells for five million dollars, you know, we have public record of that. So mm -hmm. why this is so exciting to artists and curators is now we have a means instead of <laughs> trying to track down these USB drives that have been signed, you know, we now have this publicly verifiable provenance. We now have the blockchain is doing those rec that record keeping for us with these objects, these mm -hmm. di digital yeah. objects. Yeah. Um, you know, that's the utilitarian aspect I would promote to any collectors in the IRL art world who are maybe getting, I'm hoping, getting curious about this space to go, mm -hmm. this is in many ways superior to collection in the IRL art world because it can't, because it is publicly verifiable. No yeah. sneaky tricks or monkeying or price inflation or anything like that, you know, can really happen aside from the practice of wash trading, which is a whole other topic that which is essentially if an artist were to buy their own work under a, under a different account it happens in the real art world, too. Um, it's it's almost like a philosophical problem of people. It's insider trading. It's people setting their own numbers. But just like in the real world, you can kind of figure out who's doing that. If, if an mm -hmm. artist has the same collector over and over again, and that collector is anonymous or no one knows who they are, yep. maybe that's fishy. But um, it's just to say on a spiritual level, again, I think Blake hit the nail on the head that we are only just beginning to see the foundations of what this becomes, you know, mm -hmm. everything. It's, it's almost mundane to say, well, of course, we're going to see displays be developed in the future. You know, we're going to see the next generation of like what electric objects was back in the day yeah. you know? mm -hmm. and an infinite objects is now we're going to see, we're going to see displays emerge. NFTs are so much more than how we display them. And mm -hmm. I, I'm a collector myself. I, you know, since I've been in this space so long, I couldn't help but start 
uh, collecting work too. And as a collector, I can say that the ownership of an NFT, it is, it's this special bond to that artist and their career. It's saying, I put my money where my mouth is. I, I, not only did I like this person's thing on Instagram, I paid them. I, I gave yeah. them money to say, I know I like that so much. I want it in my collection and I want my name tied to it. Mm -hmm. And in my case, I don't really collect speculatively. A lot of collectors do. They're collecting because they want to resell it. They're, they're finding people who are like not pricing their work very high right now going, that person's going to blow up one day. Mm -hmm. Very smart to do that. It's just a different approach. I, I collect because I collect things that excite me. And previously, I was not in the position to support my peers like this, to support these media artists whose work I find so incredible and so important to me. Um, it, it's really, it is, I mean, it's kind of, maybe it's a sentimental word, but it is almost like a spiritual thing to feel that kind of connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really relate to that. Uh, similarly, I only collect things that are exciting to me or speak to me on some level. And um, seeing my peers even get into it, um, you know, we have a Discord group, a handful of us. And I remember when we were first getting into it, we're just like, oh my God, like we can literally support each other. And this is amazing because it's not just like, let me buy that $25 print off your shop that's like eight by eight and whatever. It's like, no, this is like, it feels almost more tangible in some way, just because it feels closer to the source medium. You know, I don't want to get a second, like a print is a second edition off the original because we're not literally drawing it. We're digital artists. And so it just feels like I'm more connected than ever to the medium itself when I'm both producing as well as being able to collect or bid on my peers' work. And there's just, yeah, I think that Sarah really hit on the head with everything, but that wholesome feeling I haven't ever felt mm -hmm. in the digital community until really introducing myself to crypto art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it almost feels more pure to own a token than to mm -hmm. like have the, the cruft of a physical representation of, you know, whatever the spiritual feeling is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you go about providing that context for your work? Because I think that's always a challenge with any kind of net art. Um, mm -hmm. that it's a tab among other tabs or mm -hmm. it's a post among other posts. There's so many things competing for our attention. Yeah. How do you as um, participants in this space go about communicating context for your own work and making sure that that comes across? Is that important mm -hmm. or is that all just embedded in the piece itself? I mean, when it comes to explaining, I like to go like into art history mode and be like, when photography first came out, painters were like, nope, nope, that's not artwork. Like we we don't care about this. And they really devalued the oh, shit absolutely. out of photography for yeah. a long time. And I'm like- With video people, as well. Yeah, and video. And so it's like, now you see how those have become lucrative on the currency side, but also very revered on the cultural side over the years. And so I just always give that example. And I'm like, that's it. Take it how you will, but if yeah. you sleep on it, you'll probably be looking back at people that used to shade on photography and videography as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that whole art in the age of reproduction. Um, there's a, the documentary in the book as well, the famous paper. I forget mm -hmm. the, uh, the author, but yeah, exactly. It's an age old like situation, and uh, yeah, honestly, like nothing's changed about that. Um, but yeah, it's just a new thing. I think um, in terms of like context, like at Sauce Up, we're trying to provide that context for a lot of works, um, and not just another tab is a is a something we you know say a lot uh, between AJ and I is you know mm -hmm. it, it is really tough for it to exist amongst all these different things. Um, your attention is being pulled in you know a thousand different ways, and the potential you know it, three three clicks away, and you're on any website in the world. How do you like? How do you give meaning to something? Um, and we, we tried an experiment back in the day um, where we would full screen the tab that you were on. And if you closed it out of full screen, we'd like kick you out of the gallery, um, which is pretty fun. I thought that was really, really <laughs> like, fun and clever. Um, but at the end of the day, it's also kind of like, um, like not, not aggressive, but antagonistic uh, to the viewer. Um, forcing them to be there. You want that balance of like, they, they want to invest their attention mm -hmm. and their, um, really it's just attention. Um, yeah. 
And so it's, it's hard. Um, and I think a, a big way to create that is to create a community. Um, mm -hmm. I think communities are the, the secret there, um, a social layer. Um, and that, that means that's both on like a longer time scale of like, how do you, um, you know, build not your brand, but your, um, your artistry, like how do you make yourself sustainable, but also on like a short time scale of like, mm -hmm. in the case of Sawspot, how do you keep people on the site um, to, to go through the 200 amazing works um, when they could just, you know, pop over to Facebook and get their dopamine hit right, right there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think social and community and, and giving people human connection and long-term interaction like that is, is the key. Sarah, yeah. I would also say, yeah, you are, you're great at this. You're really great at storytelling and just like crafting a narrative across like all these different platforms. Um, how do you convey the context for your work? Like, what are you thinking about when you're telling those stories? Right. So, you know, it's Matt, you bringing up social, I think this is what's exciting about this is now it is our opportunity to make social media work for us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the same way that crypto art itself, it feels like we're hacking capitalism. You know, we all have to live in it. Uh, I think that you can decry it till the cows come home. You gotta, you gotta fucking <laughs> pay your bills and eat dinner, you know? <laughs> um, so the options are either like be so principled that you starve or find a way to make it work for you. And this mm -hmm. is, I think, a way artists are finally now we having been at the lowest men or lowest humans on the totem pole for so long, mm -hmm. you know, creatives are not treated very well in the, in the grand scheme of capitalism. This mm -hmm. is us now going, you know what? Fine. I'm, I'm jumping off this totem pole. I'm starting my own totem pole over here, you know, of like, yeah. um, uh, of, of getting to define it for ourselves and social media, mm -hmm. you know, you everyone is critical of we're all critical of it especially now it feels like it's entered this really gross late stage you know mm -hmm. with the changes to instagram the fleets on tweet and <laughs> you know, i'm like it's again that thing and yet we're all on there we have to be it's you know it's a privilege to 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 still be able to make a living and not need to use social media for that living so I really view it as, okay, I'm going to make social media work for me. And this is mm -hmm. now, it's something I've been doing for a long time. I, I came up with my screen name, The Sarah Show, when I was eight for AOL Instant Messenger. Yeah. And with it, it served me well through <laughs> many iterations of my life. Um, and that's why I stick with it, even though it's, you know, it sounds like a screen name a child would come up with because it is. <laughs> um, but I do think it it helps. It's It's part of that, right? It's like, all of us with our social media, we are all crafting our own little cults of personality. And it used to be, it used to feel like I'm screaming into the void, trying to make meaning out of chaos because life is terrifying and death is, is inevitable. And I want to at least try to, you know, wave my hands around and make somebody see something while I'm here. And now there is like this next piece to it that I can now see all those actions of mine help provide context into this world I have inside my head that I translate into visual art. Um, I now am using social media to allow people to get the context on this work, which then translates to this purchasable, collectible piece. Um, it's finally, it's this missing, was this missing component for me for a very long time of, instead of it just being this sort of futile endeavor uh, it now is actually feeding into a loop that is making my life work a lot better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally. Yep. Yeah. I love that hacking capitalism phrase. And like, <laughs> yeah. It, it really is the power to like write the rules ourselves mm -hmm. um, and not even in an abstract sense, as well as like in a very literal sense. Um, like for example, the, the 1970 15% resale, uh, contract that was never used because like interacting with the economics of your work as an artist was like not okay. Um, now you can just put that into the NFT as you know, 15% resale royalty down to back to the artist. It's just part of the contract It's part of the code. It's it feels supernatural. It like just works. And so like 50 years later, we're finally getting to like write that rule and make it happen. Um, that's like, that's really, really cool. Mm hmm. Yeah. I think we have a couple yeah. of minutes left here. Um, 
two minutes left, I'm just told. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> this is actually a really great note to end on though. I love the, everything that just came up right now, um, that you're responsible for your own market, you're responsible for telling your own mm. story, we're hacking capitalism, dismantling capitalism, maybe I could propose. Um, <laughs> Um, that's a really exciting time and a really exciting space. And I really appreciate the pioneers and key thinkers um, joining me this morning to talk through it. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, maybe we could just go around and say our socials if um, so people can follow us. Blake, do you want to start? Sure. I am Blake Catherine and that's it. Got that username on all <laughs> all places, baby. So that's it. Nice. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm at the Sarah Show since since 1996. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I am Matt G Condon on Twitter. Um, shout out to Twitter having a username length, um, and then <laughs> one of the many Matts on Instagram. O N E the many Matts. Yeah, spelled it out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And I am at with FND on Twitter and with Foundation on Instagram. So nice. thank you, everyone. Cool. Thank, thank you. All. you. This was delightful. Great chatting with you. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for the speakers for the insightful NFT panel. Hi, it's Erica, and I'll be the final MC for the rest of the show.